Hello and welcome to Winto 2021. I hope that so far you're enjoying the lectures and all of the guest speakers and all of the information that's been provided to you. My name is Krista Mitchell. I am the um, program director for the St. Phillips College Respiratory Care Technology Program. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about my story and um, <clears throat> how I came to get to where I am today, as well as a little bit about respiratory therapy and a little bit about how to get into the program and our program here at St. Philip's College. Um, first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about me. I have approximately 19 years of experience in respiratory therapy. It all stems from um, <clears throat> the associate's degree that I received in 2002 from Temple College. I um, was very thankful that my sister uh, being a nurse got me into and interested in the health science program at the high school that I attended. They um, kind of opened my eyes to the various programs that are out there and uh, various types of health professions that are out there. My interest kind of landed with respiratory care for a couple of different reasons. I liked that um, I could be a little bit of a social butterfly and kind of go from one unit to another um, in comparison to such as like maybe a nurse where you're assigned to like, let's say labor and delivery, and that is your place of employment. With respiratory, you attend the respiratory care department, but then you're kind of dispersed to your assignment for the day. And that could vary from neonatal ICU to a rehabilitation if it's attached to the hospital, um, all different locations. And that's something that really appealed to me. That, and I kind of felt like um, with being a nurse and I'm only, I can only keep bringing up nursing because it's so well known. Um, with being a nurse, you can, um, sort of be tethered to the patients that you have assigned to you for the day, whether it be two if you're in the ICU or up to six if you're up on the floors. Um, but with respiratory therapy, you could have a um, set number of patients, such as like 15 or so, and you would go and see them, provide your therapy, provide your education, do your assessments on the patient, and then you're, you're done um, until next rounds that you go and see them again. The ICU works a little bit different because you could be in and out of the room as needed, but it's kind of set on, an, on a schedule of therapies and treatments um, to a, a you know, as needed basis. And I really liked that. Um, <clears throat> so when I was able to kind of partake in the exposure to different professions that were out there. I was able to, to land on really liking respiratory and was able to do a kind of internship, if you would, in my senior year of high school. I dove right into the respiratory program following um, high school and graduated respiratory at 19 years old from the associates program there in Temple. Um, <clears throat> I didn't think I'm, even though I love learning, um, it was very difficult for me as a learner and, um, and, and struggled quite a bit with education. So I never really, uh, dawned on me that I'd be going back to school. I kind of thought, yeah, maybe I will one day, but didn't really see it as a, um, a true possibility until I just all of a sudden decided a couple of years later, almost 10 years actually, as a matter of fact, um, into my profession to go back to school. And I gained my bachelor's and then went on immediately after that to gain my master's degree in business administration and am back in school now for um, a doctoral program in education. <clears throat> and those degrees have allowed me to um, use my knowledge base in all areas of the program um, and 
the experience that I had in the field varied anywhere from the neonatal environment to rehab, to home care, and um, back again to, you know, uh, sales and now to education. So kind of all over the map in terms of different experiences with respiratory. Those experiences have allowed me to share my knowledge in different perspectives with the student population whenever there's questions in terms of scenarios um, that they don't understand and can't make into reality. Um, one of the things that I would highly encourage you to um, consider when looking into a program is being able to shadow if you can, which a video that I'm gonna show you here a little later will touch on that as well. The um, chance to kind of see that exposure and what I was able to do early on in my career was, uh, was see it in real life. And I bring that to the forefront because I've known people in my lifetime, such as a pediatrician as one of the best examples that I can think of. They went to school for a very long time because they loved children. But lo and behold, <laughs> when they actually got out and started practicing, they had to deal with the parents, <laughs> which they didn't like quite as much. So, it's quite a big investment to not be 100% in love with your job once you graduate. So even if you use this as a stepping stone to help you in other areas of the career, I think it's definitely worthwhile. It has a whole lot of um, different aspects, very much critical thinking skills and, and critical thinking abilities, as well as sort of being mechanically minded um, you have to troubleshoot ventilators and troubleshoot equipment to find out if the machines are um, working adequately. Um, <clears throat> if you can't troubleshoot the machine itself and identify where the problem is, you have to work your way back. Um, and, and, you know, you always work with the patient first. We have a lot of people that are kind of um, adrenaline junkies and we're there for life-saving maneuvers where we do CPR and we're there with all the codes. Those people usually end up um, as long as they're very knowledgeable on the transport team and um, put those adrenaline, adrenaline, adrenaline skills to good use. But then there's also career paths um, within our professions, um, different job opportunities that allow you to kind of just take a little bit more relaxed approach and slower paced, such as rehab facilities. Um, nevertheless, it's something that I really recommend that you do to shadow someone or follow someone, if at all possible, to give you kind of a, a bit of a more day-to-day -day view and aspect on the career rather than just money and how long the school will take you and those kind of traditional ways of picking a profession. Um, getting a little bit more into respiratory therapy, I've kind of told you some aspects of how you can move from unit to unit, um, but a little bit more of the patient population. I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you. And um, you'll have to forgive me, this is used, utilized usually for our information sessions, but it'll do for these purposes as well. Um, to just talk a little bit about what respiratory therapy is. So I'm going to bypass the sign in. Um, you graduate from a community college or even a university or even fast based programs to perform the job skills of the industry, um, which includes treatment for the cardiopulmonary system, meaning the heart and the lungs. Um, when they say must provide or also provide life saving care to trauma patients, that is definitely the case, or usually the, I would argue, one of the most important. Um, key members to the team when doing a code. Um, the types of patients that we treat 
are, and you may have heard of some of these disease processes, um, asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, otherwise known as um, COPD, if you have two of those, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, chest trauma, heart-related diseases, newborn and pediatric diseases, and so many more. I'm just gonna share with you, hopefully you can hear it okay, the um, little video that we show for our, um, on our um, projection screens um, as a bit of an advertisement. Looking for a job in healthcare? Start a rewarding career as a respiratory therapist. Become a vital healthcare team member. You could earn between 42 to 60,000 as a respiratory therapist. What is a respiratory therapist? A respiratory therapist is a certified medical professional who specializes in providing healthcare for your lungs. What do respiratory therapists do? Assess patients, analyze chest x-rays, analyze blood oxygen levels, administer breathing treatments, manage artificial airways, manage mechanical ventilators, and so much more. Apply for the Respiratory Care Technology Program today. To learn more, join us in one of our info sessions happening virtually via Zoom. Okay, so um, that just showed a little bit of um, you know, kind of putting, I guess, pictures with the um, with the discussion of the types of uh, skills performed on the job. Um, where are the areas that we can work? I kind of touched on this as I went through some of um, my discussions on um, where I've worked and and you know the people that love the adrenaline junkies versus um, kind of slower paced. If you'll notice, everything from the diagnostic laboratories down, the research facilities and home care businesses, those usually are um, Monday through Friday, eight to five jobs. So we have quite a few that might be interested in um, those types of job opportunities just based on the schedule. Um, but some like the schedule better, for instance, my husband always used to argue with me about how fortunate I was to work 12 hour shifts when I worked at the hospital and that gave me four days off. However, I my body didn't do well with the 12 hour days and therefore I um, had to take like a whole day to recover sometimes if I worked three days in a row. Um, so I think it's that's an important factor as well. Um, but now that I'm in the education world, I'm, you know, I'm still able to practice as a respiratory therapist and, and do great with that schedule. So, um, just something to know the different, uh, availability hospitals and rehabilitation hospitals, um, skilled nursing facilities, usually the hospitals are the number one location in which you could gain employment just based on the sheer number of job opportunities compared to the others. Again, as we touched on, you can work with the little bitty premature babies that are about that big, kind of fit in the palm of your hand, all the way up to your geriatric patients and um, all over the map and in between. Um, and as it was mentioned on the video, our mean annual income uh, nationally is 61,330 and um, locally for the state of Texas is more like 55,000. I would say though, even though you start out quite a bit lower in your first year of employment, after you gain that one year of education, um, you're able to market yourself quite a bit better um, if you can speak to the skills learned for the year um, and, and come out um, kind of um, using that in your favor to uh, find the appropriate employment that you deem fit for that salary. Um, here's a little bit more about our program. It's a two-year program, six semesters in all, that's accredited by the uh, Commission of Accreditation and Respiratory Care. Um, after a successful completion in the program, you will gain an Associates of Applied Science. And then to practice as a respiratory therapist in the state of Texas, uh, you're required to uh, get a Texas Medical Board license. So 
they kind of say, okay, you have no felonies. Um, you know, you're not a dry act addict and um, you can practice in the state of Texas with medical, you know, medically related working with meds and, um, you know, taking care of patients. The other entity in which you would have to work with is um, the National Board for Respiratory Care. And they're the ones that provide the examinations, which in turn credential you to become either a certified respiratory therapist or registered respiratory therapist. A lot of the pictures that you'll see are from actual students in our program since 2018 and cohorts since then. Um, we have one of the best labs in the state that I'm familiar with that includes the universities. We have a number of pieces of equipment that show real, it's like state-of-the-art real world scenarios. So that way um, our students can get familiar and feel in a comfortable setting within the lab uh, with the equipment that's used out in the field. Um, I do like to show our uh, faculty. Um, I'm not trying to show off or anything, but I do love the fact that we have such a wonderful group of individuals that are truly passionate about education, want to be there, want to be doing, and it's not just a paycheck, um, always available for our graduates to tutor, always available for our students. We really bend over backwards and I feel very fortunate to have every single one of the team members uh, that's on our team. So you'll see me up there at the top um, and then our director of clinical education, Christian Baker. And then we have three other faculty um, and one academic lab tech who is a graduate of our program. And the um, most recent um, one before Desiree was also a graduate of our program and they do a wonderful job in assisting us. So um, one of the most important things that you could do or the highest scoring criteria, the one it, that's weighted the most, I should say, um, would be your prerequisite courses. Um, that's the minimum eligibility that in the prerequisite courses, the three or four that you take, that your prerequisite GPA would be a 2.8 or better. So in other words, you wanna get the highest grade possible for those courses. If you were, even though our minimum is a C for the grade, you want to um, definitely make higher than that. For instance, if you made a C in all three or four of the courses, your uh, GPA would be a 2.0 rather, which would make you fall below the minimum. Um, I wanna make note, so the requirement is 1301 composition, 1314 algebra, but for a &P, we have kind of a fast track course called um, biology 2404. Um, it's kind of a combination health, um, um, spruced up, I guess you would say, um, combined course for a &P. That is non-trans, it does work to get in the program, but it is non-transferable. So in other words, um, if you wanted to continue on to get your bachelor's, that course would not transfer for you to the other institution. Um, if you don't have time to get both a &P one and two, and you want to still take 2404, you have the opportunity to then take one and two later um, and the 20, let the 2404 get you into the program. Those are options that you have, but it's not something that I recommend constantly doubling up on classes. So um, anyway, with those courses, you wouldn't get gain the highest degree, I mean, um, grade possible. Um, other courses that you would have to take outside of the respiratory curriculum at some point prior to graduation would be the humanities and the psychology. You can take it at the time of your choosing. We do have it laid out in the degree plan of a suggestion of when you should take it, but that's not a requirement. Uh, the course sequencing, you must take all the respiratory courses in order. They build on one another. 
so the preceding courses will be a foundation for the courses that follow. Um, as you'll notice, this is just a layout of the curriculum. We do offer clinical every semester from the start. The only thing is the first semester, um, you'll be on campus for the first half of the semester to gain skills that are required prior to you trying to interact or touch a patient. Certain things that are necessary um, to be able to kind of hit the ground running once we get out. Um, we do continue into the summer. And like I said, clinicals continue through both years, all six semesters. In the fifth semester or your spring semester prior to graduation, we offer a simulations uh, course, which is an assistance to the board exam prep um, after you graduate the program. Um, it's called the clinical simulation exam. A typical schedule looks like eight to five, Monday through Friday. Uh, for us. And even if you are out, like, let's say, half a day early, or have a whole day off, we recommend that you spend that time studying. Uh, so, so not to, it, it's a very rigorous program. Um, and you'll need basically all the time that you can get to study. The um, <coughs> The changes to that schedule will be required on clinical days, however, and those clinical sites could allow, uh, could require you to attend as early as 5.30 uh, or 6.30 in the morning. And the end time would adjust accordingly to eight or nine hour days um, uh, for the end time. However, it's still gonna approximately be 40 hours a week commitment to the program. Um, which kind of to piggyback off of that, um, we don't really recommend that you are employed during the time of uh, being in the program. However, we know that, you know, you have to support life. So that's understandable, but it can in no way interfere with the program. Some other things that might help you in preparation for entry into the program would be taking a medical terminology course, um, having already higher degrees earned, working in healthcare, doing anything, um, transporting patients, um, being a um, medical assistant, um, whatever you can get your foot in the door as. Um, Volunteer hours are also um, suggested, especially in the medical field. Shadowing respiratory would be very, very high on the list uh, to prepare you. Um, and then just for future to not, um, to not kind of slow yourself down, uh, also look at other common courses that you would um, consider if you were gonna continue on with your degree post graduation from our program. We have many clinical locations all over the city and surrounding areas. We don't require that you go to all of them, um, but it is a possibility that you could go to all of them. We do expect a large amount of exposure to as many as we can. Um, and no allowances will be given in terms of if one location is your place of employment or a closer facility to you. The whole point of having this many facilities is to gain you exposure, exposure to charting systems, exposure to a different culture, exposure to um, different instructors and the way they do things, different acuity levels, all of that is very, very important. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because these are the specifics to get into the program. And if you are interested, you can attend one of the information sessions. But basically, you'll have to apply and be accepted to the institution. That includes submitting all prior transcripts to the institution, having SBC as your home campus, and claiming respiratory as your major. You'll also want to prep for the TEAS exam. We do suggest a score of 65 or better. It just shows um, 
it's it's related to your success success through the program. You'll have to attend one of the information sessions. One of the minimum eligibility requirements is that 2.8 prereq GPA or the C or better in each one of the courses. Um, on our website, you can find the checklist that's available to you and the requirements of the application packet to include um, an essay and the exam scores and official uh, transcripts. Um, once you're found eligible, we contact you for further information required, such as um, a for perform for disciplinary waiver or an interview questions that you should submit. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the T's exam, but it is a prep exam. <coughs> it does um, assess your preparedness for entering any of the health science programs. You're required to take the allied health version, not the nursing version. Um, but they do have their own website that you can visit that can provide you a lot of that information. Um, once you get closer to being accepted, we do require other things to enter the program. Um, so your acceptance is contingent on passing these. It would be a background test and a background check and drug screening uh, pass, as well as um, keeping insurance, CPR, and um, proof of immunizations prior to the start of clinicals or actually being accepted into the program. Um, there are quite a few programs that provide financial assistance to um, those of, that have been accepted into our program. And so if that's an area of concern or struggle for you, um, there are places in which you can contact to um, find some assistance. Uh, we also have quite a few scholarships that we've had students win over the years and the SOMEM Momentum Plan. Um, right before graduation, you'll be required to complete another background, a, a deeper background for uh, the Texas Medical Board application. And then post-graduation, the two board exams that will credential you. Um, these two board exams, uh, to speak a little bit further about them, uh, the te therapist multiple choice exam is a multiple choice exam um, in which if you pass the low cut score, you become credentialed as a certified respiratory therapist and are able to go out and practice as a respiratory care practitioner. If you pass the high cut score on that exam, you are able or eligible, I should say, uh, RRT eligible. In other words, you're eligible to sit for the clinical simulation exam. That exam is quite a bit more difficult. Therapist multiple choice exam is difficult, but the clinical simulation exam is quite a bit more difficult. It's based on um, critical thinking skills and um, you can lose points. So for instance, the example that I always like to give is if they had a test available for you to choose, which was an amniocentesis, but your patient is a male. For those of you that don't know, an amniocentesis is a type of test that's done on pregnant women and therefore be completely not applicable to a male patient. In a scenario such as that, um, you would actually probably lose points because the it doesn't apply to the patient whatsoever, but it's also expensive and invasive, um, which means um, that the test is ex fairly extensive to perform. Um, it's not just a needle prick or um, taking a blood pressure measurement, but rather it's internal in the body um, and completely unnecessary in this case. So therefore you would lose points probably. So a very challenging exam, but if you'll remember in the curriculum, we actually have a course in which to help prepare you for that. Um, we do have many outcomes that we're very proud of and um, a lot of successes for our students and graduates. Um, we are able to provide graduates tutoring 
uh, resume assistance, anything that you can think of to help make each student successful upon graduation and throughout the program. I'm talking a little bit slow, guys, and I do apologize. I don't I hope I'm not monotone, but I've got a little tickle in my throat. I'm afraid I'll start coughing if I get too animated. <laughs> um, the school comparison. So we do have other programs in the area about just program and a fast track program to be specific as well. And in comparison to those, our um, program is a lot less expensive as well as um, compared to the fast track program, I don't feel like the, the difference in the cost is worth the few months in, earlier that in which you would graduate. If you'll notice the credentials earned for all three programs are exactly the same. It's based on your knowledge base, not necessarily your degree level. And then working at our um, graduating from SPC and be able to get out and perform um, as a respiratory therapist you're able at most places of employment and, and be eligible for tuition reimbursement. And therefore you get to earn your next degree while, um, while all the while getting tuition reimbursement and letting the employer pay for your uh, furthering your education. Um, and as stated before, we have state-of-the-art labs. We really do uh, you know, we have neonatal, um, a whole neonatal lab. We have an entire um, adult mechanical ventilation lab. We have a pulmonary function testing lab. In addition to an entire storage unit that has quite a few um, pieces of disposable equipment that we can use. Um, we also have the simulation lab that functions as a hospital um, and two-way mirrors for uh, real-time uh, assessment on groupings. We've had, for instance, in this, in this bottom picture, we've had codes going on where following the code, we can come back and debrief and kind of learn from that experience as the instructors are watching on the other side of the mirror. Um, we really have awesome labs that we can choose from. The level of involvement with other things our students are in, such as the um, competition with Sputum Bowl, as well as giving back to the community, such as attending the wellness fairs. You can see that all of our students are very happy and um, ready to kind of get out on the job. Uh, there's my information, should you have any questions or need anything. Um, I would like to go back to um, this other video for a quick moment, um, and I'm going to cut it off halfway through, but I like this woman to kind of talk to you a little bit about um, the realities and some of the negative realities, if you will, of um, the respiratory profession, as you do need to be prepared uh, for the <clears throat> possible deterring um, smells and um, workload and, um, you know, visual contact with blood and other bodily fluids, all those things are a real factor when you're choosing to take a profession. So I'm going to let her talk to you for just a second. Hey guys, so I am back again for another video and something I get asked a lot here on YouTube as well as on Instagram is respiratory therapy right for me. So I thought I would give you guys a couple of different things to kind of think about that might help you make that decision. So first thing is, what do you want out of your career? Are you looking for a career where you can help people? Are you looking for, you know, glory? Are you looking for money? Are you looking for, I don't know, you have to figure out what you're looking for. Now, just because I said these things as what types of things someone might be looking for, that doesn't mean that's what you're going to find in this career. And we'll kind of talk about all of these things in just a few minutes. So if you like critical thinking, you like being creative, and you like helping people in need, that's a good start. These are all things that you're going to do in respiratory therapy. Every day you need to be critically thinking and figuring out what the best thing to do for your patient is, as well as sometimes, especially when you're working with children or neonates, we don't
don't have equipment that perfectly fits their anatomy, so we have to be creative and figure out what to do to make these treatments or these things that we need to do work best for our patient. Something to think about, is there anything you can't handle? Do bodily fluids bother you? mucus specifically and secretions because as a respiratory therapist you will be suctioning people and there are many other professions where you will be asking people what color their mucus is and asking them to cough and then letting you look at it so if things like that bother you um, you need to find a way to get around your aversion to mucus blood bottle any other bodily secretion you can think of now you also need to figure out why you're doing this are you passionate about this area or do you think it's just going to be easy because it's a two-year degree to start if that is your main reason to going into respiratory therapy, you are going to set yourself up for failure and you're going to be very disappointed. It's an extremely difficult degree and you are dealing with people's lives. So if the only reason you are going into this area is because you think it's easy or maybe you think it's going to make a lot of money, which doesn't make the, the worst money, but it also doesn't make the best money. These are not things to focus on when you're gonna make this your life's work and you're playing with people's lives at that point. That is not okay. You need to be passionate about this screening to understand what you're getting yourself into and don't do it because someone else is trying to make you do it. If you don't wanna do something and you don't feel passionate about it or you're just kind of like, ah, I don't know what else to do with myself, it might not be the best thing for you. Now there have been cases, I do wanna say, where I've met people whose parents made them go into that field or they kind of needed a restart and even though they weren't sure what respiratory therapy was, they ended up going into it and loving it. That's not always gonna be the case. So I always suggest do your research and understand what you're getting into. Now, along with doing your research, something I suggest to most people is try talking to respiratory therapists in your area, whether that be from various schools, which sometimes that might not be the best idea because of course, if they are teaching respiratory therapy, they may not tell you all of the pros and the cons. They may be more focused on the pros. So try to talk to people that are currently in the field and try to get a good mix because you may find someone that is unhappy in their career and you don't want all of that negativity to affect your decision, but you also need to hear the good sides on both sides. You need somebody that's been there for a long time and knows the ins and outs, positive and negative, and you need somebody that has also been there for a while and they still love their career. So if you can get both, just make sure you're not sticking to one or the other so you get kind of like a well-rounded idea of what you're getting into. Some hospitals, will allow you to shadow a respiratory therapist. I've heard that some areas they don't. So definitely check with any teaching facilities in your area, any teaching hospitals, and see if you can either shadow a respiratory therapist or maybe even just interview one. And you can say, hey, I wanna do a career interview. I'm really interested in this area, but I don't know any respiratory therapists and I just wanna to get to know somebody and get their opinion on how they feel about the career as a whole. So again, I'm going back to thinking that it's going to be an easy career and an easy program. Keep in mind, you are going to spend your whole life doing this and even just the program itself, starting out with a two-year degree, that whole two years is going to be completely dedicated to respiratory therapy and you're going to have almost no free time and what free time you do have, you're probably going to be studying or doing other things that are related to respiratory therapy. So you also need to make sure that once you do start working that you understand that most places you're going to be working 12 hour shifts. And because it is in the healthcare industry, your patients come first. And what that means is that there are going to be days where you don't get a lunch, you don't get to sit down, you don't even get to go to the bathroom because so many things are happening and you're so focused on helping your patient that they come first. And you have to understand that that's not going to be an everyday occurrence. Sometimes it'll happen more often than not, but you have to understand that that is going to happen. So you need to be able to be on your feet 12 plus hours a day. You need to understand that there is going to be a lot of overtime as well, whether that is from, you know, having a busy day and needing to finish charting or having something happen at the end of your shift. You can't just say, oh, it's time for me to go home. I'm going to leave now. You guys can take care of this. No, because again, you are dealing with people's lives and you really need to understand this. I know it sounds silly, but there are so many people that I know that they understand that 
they will be helping people heal and they're going to be dealing with very sick and injured people but they seem surprised sometimes once they finally realize that they can't just go oh my 12 hours is up it's time to go home so i just want to make sure that you guys understand that you're going to have long days even on clinical i had some days that were over 12 hours and that's it's just the way it goes and again even along with that overtime sometimes you might get called in if they're short staffed because again when you are dealing with very sick and injured people you need to make sure that there are an adequate number of people to help care for them so if someone calls out or an emergency happens where there's a large number of injured people coming in at once you're probably going to get called in and you you can say no, but there are emergency situations and tragedies that happen where you are not allowed to say no. So you also need to be. And hey, I kind of stopped that a little bit short um, just because it got across the majority of what I wanted you uh, to express to you. Some of the other things, I know that sounded really negative there <clears throat> for a moment, but you also have to be very, very aware of the um the real life that happens after the the head in the clouds and uh, you know being very excited about a new possible career path um <clears throat> but rather what the day-to-day -day entails and whether or not that would still appeal to you um and sometimes you don't know until you've actually done it for a while unfortunately but I've been so fortunate in my career to do many things that also are not discussed on a day-to-day -day basis. For instance, being able to sit with a patient when no other family members were there while he was um, basically about to pass away um, <clears throat> and needed someone to kind of just be with him and hold his hand. And I'm very appreciative and fortunate in my lifetime that I've been able to experience that and be there for that individual. Um, other things like going into a pediatrics room and being concerned and knowledgeable about their medical status and assessing them without the knowing it, um, and that's what you're doing, to providing the therapies that they don't really want to have happening at that moment they don't want to feel like they're in the hospital all the while moving forward with trying to keep them entertained and um you know playing games with them or talking you know shooting the breeze but on a kid level that is sometimes takes individuals um that have special personalities so those are types of things that I find very rewarding as well that don't always get discussed. So um, in a nutshell, the I, I hope that I've been able to express what respiratory is in a lot of ways, um, the day to day, and hopefully even swayed some of you to be a bit interested in the program and becoming a respiratory therapist. It is a profession that I love so much, and I definitely love sharing that knowledge with our students now. Um, I'm available for any questions if you come to find that you have any. I truly wish you the best of luck in your endeavors and identifying what you'd like to do with your life, um, especially in the upcoming months and uh, planning for uh, for whatever degree that you're going to, um, you know, um, kind of take pathway that you're going to take that gets you to the profession of your dreams and um, your best, your best choices, your best option. Um, if you saw my contact information was on there, I can get it to um, the leaders of this organization. Uh, this conference. If you have any further questions or you'd like to reach out, again, my name is Krista Mitchell, and I do appreciate your time and allowing me to ramble and available for any questions that you may have following this presentation. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your time and um, have a wonderful day.